will have a magnificent time uh, for the rest of your stay. So welcome the speakers and welcome to the audience as well. Um, I have the extreme pleasure uh, of introducing three great filmmakers, three great film producers. And the reason why we, I invited them here is that I think Estonia is in a very unique position. We are exactly between the East and the West, between America and Asia. And that's why I think um, you know it, it would be good to, to to discuss and you know match these great territories uh, with Europe. So we start exactly by talking to producers who have brought Asia to Europe and Asia to the world. So from my left, Chung uh, Wano from Korea. Lorna T from Hong Kong and Malaysia, and Stefan Hall from Germany. So, welcome. We're tr trying to be quite informal, I hope. <laughs> so, uh, shortly, Jungwan is one of the great Korean producers. She has produced many big hits, three extreme bitters with life, most recently, Come Rain, Come Shine, which was in Berlinale. Lorna has done great TV work, also feature work. Her latest film, Postcards from the Zoo, uh, is also running at the Black Knights Film Festival. And uh, Stefan's uh, latest production, Mondo Manila, um, is also running at the Black Knights. Um, and his last film, Underwater Love, um, had a shocking run also in uh, Tallinn. So maybe, as we start, maybe we can see the trailers of these films. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. itu sebenarnya punya peranan besar dalam arah perkembangan sejarah dunia. Apa hubungannya ya Om Dev? Pak Maman tahu nggak? Katanya si jerah kalau malam-malam suka lompat pagar, keluar kadang, jalan-jalan sendirian keliling kebun binatang. Tahu? Pak Maman pernah lihat?
menurut para petinggi kebun binata uh, maksudnya yang bukan pekerja resmi sudah tidak bisa lagi tinggal di dalam kebun binatang ini だよ、俺、青木哲也。覚えてる青木くん。うん、久しぶり。なんでカッパになってんのよ。死んでさ、カッパに生まれ変わった。そうだよね。死んだよね、高校の時。沼で溺れて死んで。あれ青木くんだよ
a di very different sort of film called The Princess of Mount Ledang, which was at that point the most expensive Malaysian film ever made for five million US dollars. And it was the first time Malaysia, we submitted a film to the Oscars and so on. So my learning curve of being in the film industry was pretty steep from a sort of no budget film to a big budget film. And from that on, I was hooked. <laughs> And then I moved to Hong Kong and started working and making films from all over Asia from there. Actually, I started um, and still doing that. I'm, I'm a distributor um, since mid-1995, uh, 96, and just with a passion for Asian films at that time. We had released and introduced um, filmmakers like Johnny Toe from Hong Kong or Kitano, Park Chan Wook, and all their, f their f sometimes the first films, um, uh, or it was new at the time for a German audience to see uh, films from Asia. And um, since then, still I'm, I'm distributing Asian films in, in Germany. And um, our biggest surprise and success somehow was to discover um, so-called Bollywood movies, uh, so Indian films, um, which had been quite, quite successful in, in Germany, f not for Indians living there, but for like German, mostly female audiences, like my mother watching uh, Bollywood films as well as my daughters do and, uh, and other people love them, so that is, uh, seems quite that I'm a split personality, like loving Kim ki movies and, uh, let's say, um, a Shah Rukh Khan film. So this is actually what I'm doing. And from with that background, I just realized um, I, I want to get involved more in detail and uh, uh, in the process of filmmaking and with the people I enjoy working with. Um, so that's how I started as a producer and the first film I produced was Underwater Love, um, a Japanese pink musical. I mean, here, here you can see like a musical that maybe comes from the Bollywood <laughs> passion and, uh, and Japanese pink films is a space which I really uh, found very interesting. Uh, almost experimental in a way, genre cinema, and um, so that that played last year, and um, so that's my background. Mm. Um, I mean, all of your three of all of your films have been to many many film festivals, and somehow you know with the local film industries that we try, we try, we try, and we just don't make it. <laughs> but you know, at the same time, postcards is a very small, uh, you know, Malaysian film and Indonesian. Well, but, sorry, Indonesian. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's been shown in Berlinale and in many, many film festivals. So, I mean, how, how do you select your projects and uh, how do you make it? I think most producers I know work with. Um, directors that they think have a certain degree of talent in and they get along well. I always say that producing a film is like you you're getting married with someone. The producer and the director have to be married throughout that, you know, process of development and shooting and post production and distribution. Because otherwise if you don't get along in that sense, like like a married couple, it will fall apart because of how intimate it is to put it together and make it out there. So the first thing is always, you know, whether you're on, on you're seeing eye to eye on the type of film you want to make with the director <coughs> and then talk about then, you know, getting the script out and so on and so forth. I, that's how I would normally work. And there's a few directors that I work with a few times that I will continue working with. Uh. Uh, I worked with many uh, famous Korean director. Maybe you would uh, know uh, like Kim Ji Yoon, Park Chan Wook, Im Sang Soo, Hong Sang, Hong Sang Soo. Soo, and then next project is with uh, Lee Chang Dong. Um, but um, the Lee Yoon Gi, 
Um, when I work with Lee Yoong Gi or Hong Sang Su, so-called art house director, I pretty much give them a full freedom. I just support them what they want to make. But um, when I'm working with uh, Kim Ji Yoon or Park Chan Hook or other uh, uh, director who mostly they spend a lot of uh, money, <laughs> for, uh, production budget is quite high, and then I uh, have to to be, uh, make them more mainstream movie. So in that case, I'm pretty much hands-on in every detail. So whenever I work with them, they were shouting at me, I won't never work with you again. <laughs> but yeah, I worked a uh, few times with them. And because it's packaging is that is mainly for Korean you know, audience and ma in, as a mainstream. And even if it was 10 years ago, that was uh, budget was like over, like, like five million US dollars. So in that case, I have to, I have to, you know, keep control what they, uh, what they do. So I have kind of both way to, to work on. But um, nowadays, but for the commercial film, I think I'm pretty much um, concentrate, concentrate on packaging. So the script and the, the, the director's talents and uh, also the, um, the casting. casting. So that's what um, I'm doing. But as a producer, um, if I say uh, I have to choose one most important thing, then I have to say it's a script that I really liked or I really can make uh, a good package for myself. I think packaging is very prevalent for commercial films in Asia. Uh, if you look at all the big markets like China, Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan, um, even Thailand, for big commercial titles, it's all about you know who the director is, who the cast is, and what, top, what sort of like genre it's gonna be and that's how it's put together from very early stage to be able to then go into the next level and it's it's kind of like i think how you know equivalent to how hollywood does their packaging with directors and cast and so on um, in asia for commercial films that's kind of like in china if you have no cast great di director great script nothing will ever happen. No investor will put money in until there's actors in, attached to it. Yeah, for your information, let's say Korea industry is like more like a small Hollywood system. So let's say um, the one big Korean cast um, uh, will get one person, one star, one star can get a uh, 800 Eight hundred thousand dollar plus back, and so it's quite pretty much, uh, pretty quite eight hundred thousand dollar, right? Yeah. 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 So For Ch Chinese films, above the line can go up to fifty percent of the production budget. Yeah. So yeah. same thing, uh, same situation in Korea. So uh, the actual production budget is not that high, because above the line is too way too uh, big. So. That's that. That's why we uh, have to. Uh, producer has to make a solid uh, package, packaging. It's a bit of a catch twenty two. You the actors cost a lot of money, but without the actors, you can't really, you know, go to your finances and distributors to get money. And this is a big dilemma now. And films mm -hmm. in China, even big directors, Jia Zhang has been waiting two years to shoot his first martial arts film, and he is an big award-winning director and he has money in place but he has been waiting two years because he has to wait for the available cast so he's only able to shoot like later next year so it's a big big problem and we're trying to see if we're trying to persuade all the big directors to try to introduce more new talents to the marketplace because it's a big big problem like lack of 
actors talent pool that is good for the marketplace. In the other hand, the the Kamnen Kamshan is a budget was. Two hundred, about three hundred thousand dollars. <clears throat> Actually, there's two cast. It's a big, big cast, a, a big star in in Korea. But they did it for free. You know, it's because they want uh, something new. So that's why. Luckily, I had a uh, two big uh, star you know, on that film. But still, we cannot get. Um, that uh, budget from the investor because the script is too obviously art house film. So we was uh, we actually she was my co producer of that film. So we had a really ha hard time, but luckily we had um, we got our money in the end. But uh, it's getting uh, difficult, more difficult to make this kind of art house filming. In Asia, I mean uh, East Asia, not Southeast Asia. The good East thing with Come Rain, Come Shine was uh, the male lead actor just did a TV series that was very popular in Japan. So we managed to do a pretty good deal to Japan, and so we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan. How you pick your projects, it's an interesting way. I mean, just as an introduction, um, the Stefan's Underwater Lab was shot by Chris Doyle. And I mean, uh, could you reflect on that? Because I just yesterday was talking to a producer that, you know, do you want to make a film with Chris Doyle? And he said, I can't do it. So how did, mm -hmm. you, how did you do it? Yeah, actually, how the project started was uh, over, I mean, I, I somehow met um, a producer of Pink Films. I'm not sure if you're aware of Pink Films. It's uh, like a, a tradition of making movies in Japan which started in the 60s. It's basically, it's, these are, let's say, erotic films, but shot on 35 and made for cinema. And all, um, I would say almost every director in Japan somehow started within that space making films on a shoestring budget, only four or five days of shooting. And, uh, but the good thing is with all kind of freedom to tell your story. So they're like Wakamatsu Koji made pink films uh, in the early days, like really political or radical movies. And that somehow that excited me, this space of cinema. And I've met the producer, um, a, um, a lady, her name is Sato. Actually, her screen name is Asakura Daisuke because it's a, it's a, uh, it's supposed to be a male name because she started in the 60s producing these films and at that and these days it was impossible to have a female producer credit uh, for pink films. So, but she made like 500 films over 40 years wow. and constantly working with new and fresh talent, and this I found really inspiring to meet her and uh, so over, over a couple of times and actually a few years it took to say okay let's make something together <laughs> and uh, we we chosen then one director from her current stable and that was Imaoka Shinji like a guy who has really weird kind of humor so and we worked on a script for two years, I mean working on a script for two years sounds like hard work, but it, it took so long um, because they, every draft they sent, and I had a few comments only, they were rewriting the, the complete film. So it was like we have seven different movies there. So polishing scripts was not on their agenda actually. And so that was the longest part of the process to get kind of a script ready, which we all agreed on, that that can be made uh, and can be a very original film. And when that was ready, I, um, I uh, no, actually, you ask about Chris Doyle, right? So I've approached him my, maybe five years ago, not for uh, you using him as a DOP or something, but just because we had distributed some of the films he got, in, he was involved or DOP on. And uh, I wanted to publish a book about his works as a photographer, because he's constantly taking photos on film sets and all that. And so that's how we come to know each other and, uh, and started working on something. And then 
with that script and project in mind, I, one day I just asked him, uh, look, there is that Japanese film this summer to be shot. It's a week, uh, less than a week. Uh, there is a kappa and an anal, anal pearl involved and some weird music, <laughs> but good people. And, uh, and would you have time? And uh, so he was just thinking and sent me a text message. And because I, what I realized, uh, knowing him for a bit, that he really go by people. And of course, the, the project has to be somehow interesting, but he didn't care if it's like big budget, big crews, small budget, small crews. I think it's something else which is hard to describe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> and some kind of uh, chemistry or whatever, and and so he agreed, and um, that truly helped. I mean, to get the film made, because my intention was not to make a routine pink film, because I have to say there are also very boring films made in that <laughs> space, and not not inspiring ones, and. Um, I think in that term I'm happy. It's definitely not a routine pink film. <laughs> and Chris was just amazing. Um, I'd like to, to increase the energy and uh, on the film set and there were pink crew like the, the gaffers or, but there were also highly uh, skilled people like f um, working on all international films made in Japan. So it was a, a very exciting mixture of uh, people behind the camera. And we finished the film in five and a half days, not six days, like five and a half, like lunch break, <laughs> it was done. And I've expected the last day at least to be like super long hours. <laughs> but that is also Chris Doyle. I mean, he was like, quicker than the pink team yeah. <laughs> and this he is doesn't like to waste he's very precise in yeah that. and so everybody enjoyed because it's basically one take only you, you don't have the the you know the time or the the luxury to have another take only if it's com got completely wrong but uh, so this kind of energy was something we then really all enjoyed and um, so maybe there is an of course, it's, an, it's to have only that small money is a disadvantage in many, uh, for many, uh, for many reasons. But it can also be an, a, a very a good thing, actually, to because everybody give uh, give at its best, right? Uh, and um, yeah. <laughs> so, if I can ask, you know, what is it released already, or why? Is it? Where is it? Yes, it, um, it, I mean, it premiered Tribeca and then got to 40 festivals or even still more. Uh, there is a sales agent films boutique. They managed some sales, I think, in, in Sweden or Scandinavia. It was on HBO Eastern Europe. It was in Japan and Germany and Australia, but obviously very niche. So it's a super small film, but you can find it in the UK and so some some places. So um, how much was the budget? Shooting budget was 100,000 US dollars. And basically, I mean, ob obviously, I've tried to get some funding, like European style funding, at least for post-production, but it didn't work. So basically, it was rapid eye, like distributor, paying, uh, investing some, some money and the Japanese producer like from their pink background, they know how to get uh, that ride. And so it was just the two of us. And then we've made the film and, uh, and introduced it like to sales agents and then festivals. And so it was, we don't want, I mean, we couldn't get funds with that kind of subject. We, I remember I, I tried to cheat a bit what the film is about and... Uh, so what did, what, did you, uh, what did you cheat? I mean, uh, not, of course, I had to praise like uh, how a creative pink cinema is without, you know, uh, for funds and to think of the like cultural like relevance of exactly, pink cinema exactly. how <laughs> significant it is to yeah. the sexual revolution. <laughs> 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 and that it didn't work, so. But Arte, for example, was, they were really great. I mean, Arte, 
most of you or some of you know, is a German-French TV channel. And they are probably the only people who really, really understood and supported the film, not as co-producers, but they say, okay, go and make the film. We will watch it, and if you like it, yes, we have space for you. And actually, they showed the film, and that saved me. Uh, and so you have to be... Yeah, to find ways and not waste too much time. That's what I felt, and and money and energy to chase like or to match, like European soft money can be great for some projects, but the process also takes time. So <laughs> it's very different timelines you have, with like the momentum, like of a pink or Asian. It's completely, uh, it's completely different and. That can be a problem, actually, losing that momentum and or just finding different ways. And I, I mean, you know more by the about time, this. By the uh, time an Asian film goes to a European co-production market to pitch, two months down the road, you if a European producer comes and approach them, the film has been shot. <laughs> right. You know, things like that happen every day. So, in terms of timeline with Asia and Europe and and trying to balance the application for all the different funds which usually take at least at least six months yeah. or so with the momentum of how Asia does things and the budgets that are pretty low and sometimes they found an uncle who will give them like you know you know 100,000 200,000 and next thing you know the <laughs> film is already shot so one of the biggest things for European producers when working with sort of like the lower budget Asian films is you know, the timelines just do not match. Because the European style of working always includes the application for funds, which takes a long time. My, my average film, which is, would be a co-production, if I look at the timeline of all the funds involved, it would at least take a year. And then, you know, we have some that will be rejected or have to apply again. It'll take at least one and a half year to get any film, you know, just the shortest period of time of, of financing attached. Mm -hmm. And that was why I thought it was also interesting when we were discussing how you pick your projects. Um, I always have the feeling that here in Europe we're so focused on the script because it has to go through all these committees. You may not know the talent attached and uh, therefore the packaging is much less interesting in Europe <coughs> as compared to Asia where I have the feeling that the script is, you know, it's part of the package, <coughs> but the package as a whole is much more important to to have together. Even for more art house uh, movies also because of the type of financing is not so much subsidies I would imagine. Well for postcards from the zoo for example we shot for about 400 over th thousand euros. <laughs> All the money was uh, grants but it's not the usual applications that we did. We didn't do like ap apply to Fonsu, we didn't apply to any of the German funds, we had a German co-producer, nothing. What we did was we did really like every, you know, co-production market and every sort of like grant money that we could apply for, we applied. So we had your uh, Pusan's, uh, that time was called PPP, Asian Project Market, and then we had Torino Film Lab, and then we went to Sundance Script Writers Lab, and then we went to um, the Atelier, and we applied for Hubert Balls from Rotterdam, and we literally got funding from all the funds um, that we applied for, except for one. It was the World <laughs> Cinema Fund, and then we we premiered it in Berlin competition. <laughs> the, the irony of it all. But um, it, the 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 problem with when with postcards of the zoo was the director is not a natural script writer, so it was very tough to get a script that was ready for European funding applications. And and by the time we got all the funds that we applied for, we we had enough money to shoot and post, so we just did that. In, instead of still fine-tuning and of course the film could have been fine-tuned with a better script but the director said if my the actress started working in the zoo six months before the shoot she said she cannot wait anymore she doesn't have time to still spend time in the zoo with the giraffe because she went every day to the <laughs> zoo to clean the giraffe cage and she just couldn't you know like do it for another year or two or three so it was like it had the momentum for the 
Indonesian crew had to happen like then already and we had to go and shoot it. So that was how that came about for postcards. Um, if um, one of the things which I want to touch on is that you know if you would consider working with the European filmmakers or European co-production is that you know what is you know what are your expectations what are you, what are you looking in in the partners? <laughs> of course, money, <laughs> money and the manpower. Actually, actually, I'm I'm. I'm I'm trying to make uh, the, this company, Kamchan director, to be a kind of a commercial director in Korea. So we are going to make a love story, uh, average uh, with average budget means three hundred three million US dollar in Korea. <coughs> uh, 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 so we are so actually we are uh, trying to shoot in. Uh, Northern Europe. So actually, he's com he is coming to to do a location scouting to Tallinn to, to today. Um, so I'm um, we're trying to get us um, a co-producer co to get a uh, actually of course we need a we need a co-producer to take care of our production while we are shooting here. And also to get money, f uh, the regional funding, uh, uh, except the rebates of the com com commission. So, but I think it's the most important thing is that I really want to uh, count on uh, uh, the person, means producer mainly, the the right producer. I want to meet to help me. Uh, in that reason, that is what I want. So that I trying to make a first co-production film with Europe, actually, these days. No, no. Um, I'm working with the director of Postcards on his next film, which is a kind of pinku film. <laughs> Um, and it, it will be a European Asian co production for sure because it, it is set in the period of World War II in Indonesia and Holland. Because also, one of the things that I've talked with Edwin a long time was like there's not a lot of discussion going on between Holland and Indonesia and th that history that they shared for couple of hundred years and I asked Edwin what do you think what sort of film would you want to make he said I want to make porn <laughs> and I went like okay we have to find a way to reconcile making porn and looking at history and um, when I so with this new project really really what would be really crucial is to get on um, producers from Europe who can help us with you know doing a better script and you know maybe in terms of the technical side also create a sort of like stronger film um, and and make it a really fun historical pornographic right. film <laughs> <laughs> that's good we meet here Lona. yeah it's good we'll I sign a deal later yeah, i yeah. want to learn more about that <laughs> Actually, the, the next film I'm working on, I mean, Monde Manila is screening here, so hopefully you have a chance to see it. Uh, it's by Kevin De La Cruz, a director from the Philippines, who I, from Manila, who I really respect and love what he's doing. I mean, he's, he's done, I think, so far 35 films or something. Uh, since we started working on our next film, which is called Ruined Heart, that was in Paris projects this year in you in June, we want to shoot that early next year um, with Chris. <laughs> we got him excited about the project, or better, I mean, Kevin and Chris come along quite well, so uh, they met already, and um, so this is something. Uh, new and exciting for me to do, and um, I hope yeah, I can can learn something 
uh, it's in a way, I mean, we're talking about this, so the European system, I like what, what you said, Lorna, that to get the project out there and to, uh, no matter, sometimes it's may, it may not be funding what you get, but like talking about it, like what we're doing here, is that people are aware of it and... and build up a good will. I mean, I, I don't yes. think Edwin would ever get into Berlin competition for a second time director where the first film was still pretty sort of like, you know, low key and nobody, it didn't win any major awards before that. So to be able to have a second film premiere in Berlin competition is something that I think was the legwork that was done beforehand, how we went to all the different co-production markets and met with all the different sales agents, with all the different co-producers and all the different festivals and really tell them, you know, like, what is the project about, what does the director intend to make. and. I think you build up, in a way, everybody's talking about using all this social media. Um, I think one of the ways that as film producers, we do all these festivals day in and day out to build up that sort of like following, so to speak, of fans for your, build up likes for your project so that when you are ready to put it out there, you have enough of a base right. to, you know, um, enough support enough likes to do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and what I what I enjoy uh, about this legwork, as you say, is like ideally you find like, um, let's say, like-minded people or how to say, or like an, as a producer, I don't want to go uh, in a strategic way only, but uh, if you find, let's say, um, <laughs> An a build an alliance of tastes, like you have a distributor in Australia who like what you're doing, and maybe a distributor in UK who understand the kind of taste or where you're coming from, so you don't have to explain about this filmmaker you want to work with. And then there is, you know, some maybe a sales agent you 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 know that is the space he that you you're not wasting time in like convincing someone who, which is probably that's not his cup of tea. Yeah. So once you know uh, there's a, a bunch of people um, who are aware of the project and that for is, it's good like going to these co-production markets, I think, to, to meet them and to get an idea of uh, who you want to approach once your film is uh, ready. Or um, I think that is something I'm looking for. And I'm like enjoy talking to Stan or <laughs> uh, yes, and so yeah. Actually, uh, I think is the the language language thing is not a, that a big problem at all for the co-production. I think, um, and also I know there's a lot of uh, producer who are open to working with um, uh, new new experience like. Um, I mean, uh, to me, it's, there's so many good producers in Europe to work with, uh, willing to work with the uh, Asian project. The problem is, I think, that as uh, Lona said, is the time difference. All, most of Asian films are so fast. I mean, they're making film, sometimes uh, we're making um, one film in one month, if we want to. So it's that fast. But in Europe, it's, gonna, it's not going to happen. So we have to, uh, that is the most difficult thing to work with um, Europe for me. So we have to adjust the time um, together. That is, that I'm st I, I start to learn how the difference is at the moment. We have time for questions now. Explain the last part. How do, how do you make it happen so quickly and to my home? In, in Korea, for example, the, there's a, a $10 million budget film did a three days sound mixing <laughs> for a, 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 for the because of the releasing date fixed. So 
cannot believe ten million dollar but uh, budget films during a uh, three days mixing. So it happened. It, it could happen. Uh, let's say we are uh, Korean. Um, we are uh, we we hire the crew uh, based on uh, one but, uh, whole kind of uh, how can I say three months base basic package. package. Mm -hmm. So we can work 24 hour, hours uh, <laughs> per seven days. So you Not don't, in you, you don't need to pay Asia, over only Korea. <laughs> so but you have to provide lots of cigarettes and, yeah. and, and cooking so on site. We are very <laughs> flexible for the production wise. There's, so that's a, it's extreme case, but um, let's say the most important thing is you have to open this your film on s certain date to show the audience. Then we, sometimes the Korean director is shooting seven months uh, for uh, production, and then there's no time to do a post production. Then you have to do it in one month, whole post production. But not in Europe. That's not going to happen. So I think the question was, how do we make it so quickly? Yeah. In how then, do we get to shoot it yeah. so quickly? Perhaps what happens is, uh, yeah. So what happens is when we, when the idea develops in the director and producer's hands, uh, of course, then they already start talking to people within Asia. But of course, the ideal thing is to be able to get the best partners, which is not necessarily just from Asia. But with sometimes, once you start pitching the project in Asia, you have m a variety of different funds. Either it could be like film companies, film studios that are set in Asia. Um, the, the, the crisis in terms of it hasn't hit Asia as badly as um, it has hit Europe. So there's still quite a, uh, there's still quite a lot of funds you can tap into in Asia to look for funding. Um, there's less soft money, um, but there's a lot of different, you know, companies and funds. And then there's also what we call this new generation of people who are rich and wants to be involved in the film industry, who wants to do red carpets, who wants their daughters, boyfriends or girlfriends to be in appearing in movies. So there's another, you know, variety of like investment that you could tap into. And uh, now there are cer certain funds set up by government in different parts of Asia. Just re just in the past two years, there's also like a lot of suddenly the governments are beginning to, oh, you'd be good to, you know, get, uh, do more film related, build up our content, so to speak, local content. So, and, and overnight things will just happen. And, and before you know it, you have all your financing in place. And... <laughs> And then sometimes when you attach one actor, usually and actors are so influential, the big name actors are so influential, they have, either they put in their own money or they put in their best friend's money or people have been knocking on their doors who want to put in money. So if sometimes you just have to attach one name and that one name can bring you, like the next day, every distributor in China says, oh, you have this person. You have Jackie Chan. OK, we all want your film. We'll give you whatever you want for it. You know? And this sort of things just happen overnight. It's just like one name and snap, it's done. And somebody like Chris Doyle being attached to a project in Asia is also very prestigious because he's one of the best in the world. And so having packaged him, immediately you may be able to get an actress <laughs> who's very interested to work with him. And then it's just like, Okay, Chris Doyle says yes, then two, two weeks later the actor says yes, and then two days later your deal is done. It sounds a bit like too good to be true, but it just happens that way. And then they said, uh, then the next thing they ask you is, when can you deliver the film? Because they have to lock down the releasing date. And that's kind of, oh, and can you shoot like next month and deliver in four months down the road? Because we have a slot coming up. And these things just like run like that. So how long time do you usually spend for development? Um, <laughs> my case mostly over one year, <laughs> for, especially for the script. But uh, doing, po I mean, real pre-production means packaging is, I think, is just. 
two months, three months. And then after you got the name of a uh, cast, actually the the investor didn't care about um, the script that much because they asked me first who's in it. That is the first thing they ask. They want to see the poster before they care about reading the script. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Actors are so important for the financing of your film. Isn't the system a bit comparable to the Hollywood system where the yeah. agents are the big players actually in the end who will decide which film? Well, luckily, well, uh, we don't have a, that uh, big, big uh, manage, uh, agencies. Agency agency and yet. management. But it's coming, uh, I think, it's sooner or later. But still, the actor uh, manager has a power. But luckily, the producer can approach to the, the cast directly. Mm. Well, she can, you know, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean in Korea. The, the, in, in, in China, Hong Kong, um, it's, it's very much tied into, like, a lot of actors are associated with a certain company. So sometimes it's also like if you want money from a certain company, you have to work from cast from within that company to sort of, like, put it together. So Huayi Brothers, for example, have a whole stable of actors. And if you want to, say, have Huayi finance and distribute your films for China and worldwide, it has to be sort of like working with Huayi talents. And so sometimes it's finding that balance between the cr creatives that you want you know, in the film and your financing package. So, so like you know, Hong Sang-soo and Lee Chang-dong is a pretty much fa a famous director. Actually, for them, actually, the like, there's a lot of French um, soft money wants to put their money into their project, but actually, they don't want to wait for that that long procedure. So they don't need that uh, that uh, the French money or European money because still they have some. There's a lot of uh, investor from Asia that want to to participate participate mm -hmm. on that. And besides, the European money is going to be expensive because you have to spend <laughs> yeah. all the money and more in Europe where you know, everything is free for the, the whole 100% or 110% or 120% spend that you have to do for yeah. Yeah, but they don't want to. The money. They don't want to invest the young, uh, talented filmmakers from Asia because they are. They think it's uh, no, but also economically, like one of the things we thought about doing. Uh, with postcards was if we get some German funds, we have to do post production in Germany, yes. and what they give you is a hundred thousand perhaps, but you have to spend a hundred and twenty thousand or a hundred and fifty thousand in Germany to qualify for the funds. So for us, we could have done that post production for fifty thousand in Asia. So it it really at the end of the day didn't mm -hmm. kind of balance out in terms of the cost also. So. Yes. How much does it increase, uh, uh, I mean, attaching the name cost? How, does, how much does it increase the budget? Uh, it depends on who it is and how, how, you, how you negotiate with them. So somebody like Jet Li gets paid between 10 to 15 million US dollars. Uh, no negotiation, uh, <laughs> uh, unless he is the film he really wants to do. He had, he did a film with a first time director in China recently, where he came on board as a producer, which means probably he participated in sort of like a producer's fee, the back ends, the profit share, and so on. So it really depends, but. A name cast in Hong Kong, China, the Chinese speaking territories at the moment, really is absurd. It really like you're talking about a figure of at least 500,000 US, but usually about a million to two million US for a, a, a cast that a Chinese distributor would like. We love the, this cast, we'll take any film with this cast. So there's about 10 people with that sort of names in Chinese-speaking territories, then, yeah. So there's too much money behind two, only a few people. And for me, I mean, as a distributor, if I s go to a Hong Kong Film Mart or something, the little I know about mainstream Chinese cinema, I think 
pretty much looks all the same. So <laughs> yeah, it becomes a problem. I mean, now I understand better what yeah. you're saying, like how these films are made. So luckily there is uh, lots of art house or challenging projects and other things. Well, it's a bubble because mm. these actors actually, they, they are not worth that much money, <laughs> no, you know. know, because they don't generate that sort of box office. Uh, as mm. it's, but with their names, only does the investors and distributors become sort of like, they feel secure. They feel like, okay, this project has this name, so we, we can do it. But, you know, nobody really knows what actually works in, in China, for example. Nobody really knows. Everything is a, such a gamble. Uh, but the gamble is minimized if you use a name actor. But it doesn't guarantee anything. And we have seen so many big names this year in China that has budgets of like 5, 10, 15, 20 million US dollars with big name stars. Like, that's didn't do anything. Sometimes work because the company in Kamshain's case, the the main two, uh, one uh, the actor is really big in Japan. So actually, we sold to Japan more than the budget. So <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite lucky. So still, but um, basically, it's really hard to get uh, money for that kind of this kind of art house film. But even a commercial film, yeah. like somebody very famous in China, an actor very famous in China. So for example, say somebody like, you know, um, Guo Yao. Guo Yao, who is like considered the top five actors in China. But how many people in this room know who he is? <laughs> Hardly anybody. So his name only works in China, right. you know. So it really is. But he his asking fee is probably between you know one to f three million U.S. dollars for and a is film. He, is he making a uh, one film a year? Or no, he's yeah. not. <laughs> Five films a year or ten films a year. So there's no unique point to sell uh, to go to audience. This is really crazy market, especially China. It's it's a bubble that we we hoping will burst soon. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? So, oh. uh, so in the end, uh, after all this uh, description of kind of rigid European systems and uh, bringing out the quick. Possibilities to make, I mean, possibilities to film, make films quickly in Asia. What is your interest, actually, working with Europe? Well, so uh, this time, uh, this this project that I'm trying to work uh, with Europe is uh, that Korean man and woman they're falling in love in uh, snowy island. So that's why I need a snowy landscape in northern Europe. <laughs> but uh, and also that's a uh, kind of a nudity. It's More eroticism. <laughs> yeah, another <laughs> snow related to eroticism. <laughs> you see a trend here going. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the problem is Korean Asian uh, actresses is, is re reluctant to be naked at all. <laughs> but I want a name uh, cast and star cast on this project because it's three million budget for the Korean market. So it's um, luckily, actually, I prepared this project three years ago. I already had a script three years ago, but I couldn't get a right cast for this project. So we have to postpone it another year and another year. During that postponing, I was had. To a lot of time to discuss with European producer, so they could they could prepare some um, things in Europe. In Europe, it's just quite a special case, I think. If I if I had a right cast at that time, then um, definitely I will make the film three years ago. But that it, that didn't happen. So so I'm trying to. Make uh, and also I lost this winter, so I'm trying to make it happen next winter. So well, I still have time to talk with a uh, European producer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Could you give us an idea for if that's a $3 million film, what portion of the budget would you be raising out of three and how much would you be working on in Europe? Well, it depends. If I get uh, the right cast, then actually I don't need money from Europe. Yeah, the actually, but I because I need some uh, actors uh, from Northern Europe, and also the um, yeah, I really want to experience working with the European producer, so that I'm trying. Actually, in uh, the first uh, first option is I want want to do uh, do a co-production with Europe, and then I of, although I can make a uh, I can do a post-production in three, uh, in, in few weeks in Korea, but I really want to make a proper. I, mean, I want to experience um, three months, three months <laughs> post-production in Europe. <laughs> so to and know how it go, goes in the in the world. So we were just talking about the. Um, Kim ki Spring Summer, yeah, yeah. which was a co-production with Pandora, with, yeah, yeah. with Balmy. Kim ki is making a film uh, twice, two films a year now. A I week, guess. actually. <laughs> I supposed to uh, visit his set. Uh, he said he told me that um, he's going to finish uh, in nine days. So I okay, then I'll go to your set on the the last day. And then I went to the set, and then it's finished. <laughs> But, but so sound sound mixing took him f two weeks in Germany. Now I think he. Some directors are it's different. I mean. Different. Mm. But then, in the other hand, the commercial film, the Korean director is as uh, fifty percent of the production. Uh, uh, the film is newcomer director. It's. It's crazy. So they are not experienced. They are not ready to direct properly. So it means uh, production is going on ar around five months and seven months, sometimes on a year. So this quite I mean, we, crazy. We take the case of the, the director who did the film The Chaser, which is really, really successful in Korea and did pretty well internationally. And then his second film he shot for 272 days or the something. Yellow Sea. Yellow Sea. Yeah. And that was a big budget, you know, with co-production with Fox International Pictures and Showbox. And it was meant to be shot for like three months and then it just went on and on yeah, and in, on. One in, one and then the one budget kind of double and triple. And <laughs> I mean, the interest with working with Europe for me is it's I, I want to find projects that make sense as co-productions. I don't want to do a co-production for the sake of co-production. Then it, you you get what the Europeans have been doing for so long, all the Euro puddings, you know. Mm. Uh, and I don't want to do a Euro-Asia pudding. I, so that's one of the reasons why, for me, the next film with Edwin is, is talking about looking at that history that hasn't been explored so much. And then I have another project that I'm working with two Hong Kong directors that I had in Hong Kong HAF this year called The McLennan Affair. And that is a, because it was set during the time of the British, uh, before the handover to China, and all the main characters in the project are also uh, British, so it is a very natural sort of like co-production that I want to do with the UK. Um, also because it involves the police that were primarily British at that point, the legal system, um, the, the main character was somebody who was British that was murdered and so, but the directors are from Hong Kong and it was all set in Hong Kong, but I probably can't recreate 1980 Hong Kong now in Hong Kong because of the change, it doesn't look like it, I probably may have to shoot it, it will be cheaper for me probably to shoot it in a set in UK instead of bringing all the actors and trying to, you know, recreate it there, so it's, there are, there are projects that are natural for me to want to do a co-production with um, Europe. Last question. Well, actually, mainly I wanted to. I made a lot of film, um, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's some films sold to Europe quite well. Like Hong Sang Soo is Hong Sang Soo's films is quite good in France, and. 
Um, but mostly, I my uh, um, my film cannot be sold to Europe that with high I mean price. I mean, not many European people knows about my film. So also uh, doing the co-production is I'm looking for the potential market in Europe. That's why I wanted to try a uh, co-production with European producer. But I, I, I personally think that this, we live in a time where there are very few films that can cross over. So you, as producers, what we really need to kind of do is to find where your core market is. Because trying to make a film that will work for both Asia and Europe is pretty damn hard. But hopefully possible. <laughs> it's not impossible, but it's pretty damn hard. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was a great panel, Direct. great panelists, um, and I think we can talk about and set up the co-productions or uh, the coffee. Thank you. Thank you.